in this world? How should Christians live in this world? Do you think that's an easy question to answer? I don't. (laughs) That's why I'm going to talk about it for a while here. I don't think it's an easy question to answer. Actually, I'll be honest with you, I plan to talk about this for two weeks. So I'm going to try to have two attempts uh, at uh, covering this topic and, and trying to cover it well, as well as I can. And as I think about this question, um, it's, it's been brought to my mind, and, I, and I'll just say up front too that as we think about the Scripture, I've, I've, I've read this passage to you, I want you to just be holding that in your heart and mind, and we're going to get back to it in this message today, Romans 12, 1 and 2. But I am going to talk uh, at a considerable amount here about our culture, because I just really believe when Paul says do not be conformed to this world, we have to take some time to think about, to meditate on what does that mean? What is the world that we live in? And this has been brought to my attention because lately there has, in Christian circles, been a revived debate, at least in the circles that I I tend to pay attention to a revived debate about how we should relate to our current cultural situations. For example, what should our stance be toward the social justice issues and the social justice movement? And Christians, as I think about debates like that, have long struggled with the issue of how we relate to culture. Think about the early Christians, especially the Gentile Christians, coming to faith in a Jewish Messiah, (laughs) but living in a pagan world. Think about how difficult that was. And so questions like, should we eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols? Maybe not meat that it's literally in in, as part of the worship but it has been sacrificed to idols, and now can I eat this in my home? Should, should believers be circumcised if they're not Jewish? What should our stance toward the government, may, uh, toward the government be? Should we pay taxes? Questions like that. And Jesus was asked that. I'm glad Jesus answered that. Because I really believe we would have great debates (laughs) today about whether we should pay taxes, and for good reason. But that's a good thing to tuck away in our hearts and minds, what Jesus had to say there. And we'll probably get back to more of those issues next week. We'll look at engaging culture. But the question itself, how do we relate to culture, has been thought about for, well, since Christianity was founded, And uh, last century, a theologian who taught at Yale named Richard Niebuhr wrote a book that was well-known called Christ and Culture, which was talking about how how do Christians who belong to Christ relate to culture, Christ and culture. And he outlined five different approaches that Christians have utilized such as Christ against culture. And some people would take much more of a confrontational approach to how they view the culture, viewing the culture very negatively. The Christ of culture, which looks at culture very positively. And then stances that are more in between in in different ways. The Christ above culture, which utilizes culture. The Christ and culture in paradox, Uh, concept, and the Christ as the transformer of culture. I won't get into what all of those really mean, but the point is Christians have taken different stances toward culture, and uh, sometimes those stances are very stark, and, and people can become rigid thinking that there's one response to everything. Reminds me of the, you know, the, the saying about the person who if all they have is a hammer, everything becomes a nail. That's the only tool they've got. 
And some people, <laughs> we could relate it to culture, just think we just got to hammer everything. There are things we need to hammer, probably, <laughs> but not necessarily everything. Then, of course, there are the, people, the duct tape people <laughs> who think duct tape can fix everything. I'm getting amens, I think, from that statement. <laughs> so they think that everything needs to have duct tape applied. People can do that with our stance toward culture. There's one way to do this, and that's how we're going to do it. Here's the thing I'd like you to consider is Christians have lived in very different contexts throughout history and even today. I know we as, you know, as Americans, we feel as Christians sometimes under pressure, and that's true, but we, we need to be honest. We don't face heavy persecution here the way they do in other countries. They are being killed for their faith. How you relate to the government when you're in that circumstance how you relate to your culture when you're in that situation is going to have some differences than how we relate to the culture in our situation. Some countries have Christianity as their state religion. In America, we separate church and state. All of those issues we have to consider. We live in different contexts. And let me say this, even America, I think many of you know this, has changed, hasn't it? The culture we live in today is not the culture we were in 30 years ago, 40 years ago, or more. So how you might engage the culture 50 years ago is different than today because the culture is very different. <laughs> So the question, more pointedly, is how do we relate to the culture? As Christians, how do we relate to the culture in the time and place that we live in today? Because the Scripture is telling us today, this is how we're to apply. And Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Consider that for today. Today. So I have a couple points here about the culture and a couple points about response. The first point about the culture is the confusion of culture. I think uh, most people, if not all, in this room would agree that uh, we've got some moral confusion in our culture. We have some moral confusion today. I think about the questions that I've heard even just recently, whether they've been stated or, or they're implicit, the questions such as how many genders are there? Questions such as, what is, in, what is adequate consent in sexual matters? Does a fetus have rights? Romans chapter 1. Verse 24 in case this uh, just seems unprecedented to you, why are we dealing with these kinds of issues? Consider what Paul said 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Romans 1, verse 24, God also gave them up to uncleanness, the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile pass passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men con con committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to, to do those things which are not fitting 
being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. (laughs) When you say, what is going on? Why are people acting this way? This is what God is giving them over to. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. And when Paul talks about his culture that he lived in. You can imagine the Jews that he is interacting with saying, you are so right, Paul. Those evil pagans! (laughs) Those unreligious, sinful people. Then you get to Romans 2 and Romans 3. And he says in Romans 3, 9, What then? Are we better than they? How easily we can read Romans chapter 1 and come up with the religious viewpoint of Paul's day. We are better than them. No, no, no. No, no, no. (laughs) Not at all. Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are are all under sin as it is written. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Listen, we all, all are part of the problem. It's the natural bent of our hearts. (laughs) The important takeaway, I believe as we consider the moral confusion that our culture today experiences, is that you cannot find anyone who is completely in the right, which we want to do. We so much want to find something where we can go, yes, that person's perfect. But aside from Jesus, we can never say that. which makes it very difficult sometimes, doesn't it? To know how to even approach the world that we live in, realizing all are under sin. No one is perfect. So as a result of the condition of our hearts, we have all of these societal issues which Paul outlines. It's nothing new. So the questions we're facing today are just the result of God giving us over. It's, it's our sinful propensity. And that's what we're dealing with in the world we live in. And by the way, that looks like a very dark picture. But remember, it wasn't all that long ago we had world wars. And since those world wars, which were very dark times, we've had more wars. I believe we constantly as humans veer off in this direction. We have more dark days ahead, sadly. But not only is the culture confused, I secondly want to point out that the culture has a conforming nature to it because Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world, which means the world has a way of conforming us, doesn't it? I want to let that sink in because it is easy for us to say, well, not me, I'm a Christian. Really? Are you above being conformed? to the world? I'm not. (laughs) Paul is clearly saying that the culture has a way of conforming us unless we consciously work against it. We come to church on Sunday morning. It's wonderful. We have a time of worship. 
It's great to be with other Christians. And we receive this time where, where we're receiving truth. We're being encouraged in God's word. We can pat ourselves on the back, and, and it's, it's wonderful that people would take time on a Sunday to come out to church. Thank you for being here. But before you pat yourself on the back, you're receiving truth, and there are things that you are taking in, your mind is receiving, you're contemplating, but how often does the world gets to get to give its message to you? We think, well, we're not sitting under the teaching <laughs> of the world. You know, I'm not going into a building where, where I'm sitting in pews listening to someone tell me things that aren't true. Well, in a sense, we do that because we are being indoctrinated by the culture. The culture has an agenda. So the te television that we watch, <laughs> there are messages there. The news that we listen to, it doesn't matter which news, by the way. <laughs> there are agendas. The movies and the music, the books, all types of cultural elements. I would say it's pretty naive to think that that doesn't impact us. Versus all that versus church. And hopefully, hopefully, it's time in God's word that you spend with God. I hope in listening to this, maybe you start to say, I need, I need, more, of, I need more of spiritual food, spiritual input, spiritual truth, because certainly on the scale, I'm getting so much input from the world. So let me point out two ways that the world conforms us to its beliefs. It conforms us, number one, to its beliefs, and number two, to its practices. Its beliefs, first of all. I mentioned last Sunday night about a uh, man who wrote a book that was very famous. Sorry to burst your bubble, but I, uh, I'm going to speak negatively about the book. <laughs> if you liked it, too bad. Um, Not so much about that book, but the author who, who wrote that book, the book was very famous, called The Shack, written by William Paul Young. Very impacting because it's a powerful story and because it hits on tragic issues that we deal with in our lives. But William Paul Young, who wrote it, has a theology, has a belief system. And we have to consider, is his belief system what God has said about himself, or is it more what the world is saying? And he wrote a, another book after The Shack that really is, mu it's, it's, it's a nonfiction book where he just says what he believes more. It's titled, I think I've got a picture here, Lies We Believe About God. Lies We Believe About God. And a man named Gavin Ortland gives a critique of this book. He says, the, the God of lies we believe is fundamentally defined by a kind of love. This God that's outlined in this book likes us, values us, affirms us, invites us into relationships, shows interest in us, and so forth. Many of these assertions can be affirmed, and indeed, love is at the heart of the biblical portrayal of God. But the book gives the impression that God is only ever loving in this way. Displacing other traditional divine attributes and diminishing God's overall transcendence. Young, that author of the shack, disdains the idea that Jesus died on the cross to rescue us from God's judgment. He never speaks of God's authority, but affirms that God submits to us. 
He won't even allow that God's, God has expectations of us. For young, God only grieves for and with us when we act inside our darkness and lies. He, quote, is never disappointed in you. God has no expectations from you. God's strength and sovereignty are also imperiled for young. It's a lie that the cross was God's idea. That he, that he says is one of the lies. This is a supposed Christian author, and by the way, he's very well liked. If God originated the cross, the writer of the shack is saying, then God is a cosmic abuser who is cruel and monstrous. Again, one wishes for engagement with biblical text, apparently at odds with this. If the cross wasn't God's idea, whose was it? Young contends it was only our doing, a manifestation of our blind commitment to darkness to which God submitted. But could God have prevented it? One is uncertain since it is a lie, again, according to, the, to that author, that God is in control. He says that's a lie. Sitting here in a church like ours, we react against that. Good, good. But we need to consider why is that so widely accepted? Because it is the mood and belief system of our culture. It is very appealing, if you're not on guard, to accept this idea that God just is all acceptance. That's all He does is accept and affirm you. That's the belief system of our culture. I also uh, saw this exemplified. This was, I think, in a good way, though by a man who wrote a book called My Imaginary Jesus. And uh, his name is Matt Michelados. He wrote a book, he's written a couple books like this, where he gives an allegorical presentation of, of his spiritual encounters and situations. Allegorical in the sense that he's kind of mixing his real life with storytelling. And he says, my imaginary Jesus was a Jesus of my own concoction, that I had seen Jesus in a certain way, but he's questioning if that is truly what Jesus is like. So he actually goes through different uh, ways of describing Jesus in this book. And uh, he encounters a, a particular Jesus who I'm going to call him Portland Jesus because Matt lives in Portland, Oregon. And uh, Portland Jesus really has a lot of the values of people in cities today. And uh, they're sitting in a restaurant, Matt and, and uh, his imaginary Jesus. But you need to understand he thinks this is what Jesus is really like. And then walks into that restaurant an atheist who had been leading a Bible study, if you can believe it, with students at a university. I'll pick up there. Jesus, this is Shane, head of the Atheist Club at Portland State University. Jesus shook his hand politely and suggested that he try the Shazam cake. Shane agreed to give it a whirl. We're talking about things that the Western modern church has gotten wrong about Jesus. So Shane is, a, is an atheist, but he is searching. He's reading the Bible. That sounds interesting, Shane said. I have some questions. Shoot, Jesus said. What is it with Christians and homosexuality? You talk about it more, than, more often than anyone I know, even gay people. The last comment made Jesus laugh so heartily that he knocked my bowl of ice cream off the table. His eyes started watering and he excused himself to get some napkins. When he came back, he said, I agree. There's no reason to talk about that stuff. Someone's feelings get hurt no matter what you say. What about abortion, Shane asked. Oh, we've talked about that enough in the last two decades. Give it a rest. Let's talk about something we can all agree on, like eliminating poverty. 
It's time to show some compassion, not just stand around shouting truth and never showing love. That's so cool, I said, beaming. That's Matt talking. He thinks this sounds great. The other thing people get all hung up on is that my death on the cross was all about substitutionary atonement. Like the only reason I died was to take away the sins of other people. Does that even make sense? How does my dying make people's sins go away? What sort of loving father lets his son get killed? I mean, yeah, I had to die, but not because dad was punishing me for something you did. It's like dad, Matt stole some cookies and dad comes down with the belt and I say, no, 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 hit me instead and God agrees to that? No way. I nodded, but Shane looked perplexed. Explain that to me, Shane said, because I was reading the end of John the other night and I saw where you said, I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. I started looking at the cross references and I came to this book in the Jewish scriptures that said that the Messiah would be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities and by his wounds we are healed. That sounds to me like the very thing you are saying it isn't. Some sort of substitution in who is being punished. Jesus tucked his napkin in under his shirt. Don't get hung up on it. Let's stop being so judgmental. Let's work on community and learn to love each other. Let's change the way the system works. Let's eliminate homelessness and let's worship with art and music the way we want to do it. Let's allow people to come to church in an authentic way. Wear what you want, have dreadlocks if that's your thing. Let's be who we really are, not try to dress it all up on Sunday mornings. Shane sat back with a skeptical look on his face, a bite of Shazam halfway to his mouth. I couldn't believe he wasn't buying Jesus' spiel. Later on, Matt says, what did you think? Shane says, I can see why you're comfortable with this Jesus. I realized this might be the moment, the moment when Shane realized he wasn't an atheist at all, that he believed in God and wanted to follow Jesus. But Shane says, he's not the one I read about in your Bible, but I can see why you would like him. The atheist who's reading scripture is on to something. Even professing Christians can have a Jesus who is of their own making, who basically says what the world is saying, but dressed up in religious garb, in spiritual ideas. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was killed for his faith in World War II. He was a pastor, a theologian, and he said this, I either know about the God that I seek from my own experience and insights, from the meanings which I assign to history or nature, that is from within myself, or I know about God based on his revelation of his own word. Either I determine the place in which I will find God or I allow God to determine the place where he will be found. If it is I who say where God will be, I will always find there a God who in some way corresponds to me, is agreeable to me, fits with my nature. But if it is God who says where he will be, then that will truly be a place that at first is not agreeable to me at all, that does not fit so well with me. The question is, do you want a God of your own making, a God of your own liking, a Jesus who suits you, or do you want the real thing? The world is offering us false, fake, imaginary Jesuses and false concepts of God. And it's exemplified in the writings of Christian, supposed Christian writers today at times. Not all Christian writers. <laughs> so the beliefs of our culture distort our views about Jesus. And written years ago by that theologian I mentioned earlier, 
Niebuhr, he said of some versions of Christianity that it is a God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. And there are still people today who say, I'm a Christian, but I don't think we need the cross. So the culture is, is conforming people in its belief systems and in its practices, which are correlated to beliefs. What we believe ultimately correlates with what we practice, right? If you believe that God could punish you for your sin, you think twice about your life. But if you think God merely affirms everything you do, you can live however you want. So there is a very pervasive attitude in our culture about our lifestyle, our rights, our choices. My happiness is what matters the most. I should do what feels right to me. I have the right to live the way that I want. Well, that's, that's very American, but it's not Christian. For the Christian, it's not your happiness that matters most. It's your likeness to Christ. God is not orchestrating everything in your life so that you'll be happy. You've probably noticed that. But he is working all things together for good to conform you to be like Jesus. And you're not to live how you want. You're to live how he wants. Your life is not yours. It is his. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. So we live in a morally confused culture that seeks conform us to its mold. It's a confused culture and it's seeking to conform us to its mold. Then we see Christianity <laughs> come along. And what I have to say about Jesus and his message is there's no confusion. It's very clear. One of the problems people had with Jesus is he was way too clear. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all, with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. <laughs> so God is over all, and we're all accountable to him. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 10, Peter and John have been preaching, and they've gotten in trouble. They've been arrested for their preaching. And he says, as they're being tried, let it be known to you, in Acts 4.10, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you here whole. That's how we healed this lame man. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. He's quoting the Old Testament. God said there would be a cornerstone you would reject, but he is the chief cornerstone, not, and he says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's pretty clear. <laughs> we need to be saved. All have sinned. All fall short of the glory of God. I said that earlier. We all have a problem. But there is a Savior who can save you. And it is Jesus. This is not what the world's saying, obviously. The world's saying you don't need to be saved. And if you do need help, you can find it however you want. No, no, no. Christianity is very clear in its message. I'll add, too, in the 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Verse 3, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, 
The head of Christ is God. I read that verse because I'm pointing out the clarity of Christianity. He says, the head of every man is Christ. Christ is over man. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God, the Father. It's very clear. Now, what I'm reading to you, at one time our culture at large actually held to a lot of these views. Today, the very things I'm saying sound more and more strange to the world around us. And maybe, as, as we live in this culture, it starts to sound strange to us. And that's why Paul says, do not be conformed to that culture. It's going to feed you its lies. It's going to try to change your thinking. So what is the call? This is the last point I want to make here. There's that Christianity is clear as opposed to the confusion of culture and that Christianity has a call. There is a clear teaching in Christianity and there is a call to Christianity and we read it here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, listen, he's saying this, I'm begging of you, I beseech you, because God is merciful. He will save us. He loves us. That's why he said he gave everything for us. And he's reaching out to us. And he says, by the mercies of God. God has every right to condemn. But by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Present your bodies to God as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's a, it's a form of worship is what that's saying. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So three things here. Present your bodies to God. Surrender, right? Sacrifice. In other words, I, I'm on the altar, God. I'm yours. Are you his? That's what we're to say. God, I'm yours. Number two, don't be conformed. It's been the heart of this message today. Do not be conformed to the world. And number three, be transformed. So we need surrender. We need resolve, resistance. And we need transformation. We need change. We need renewal. What I love is the order these things go in. Listen closely. Surrender and worship of God always precedes accepting and doing His will. He says, if you follow this pathway, you will be able to discern and do the will of God. So, remember, the issue is not so much knowing God. It's not that God isn't clear enough. It's an issue of desire. Are we willing to do God's will? So we begin by saying, I present myself to you because of your mercy, because of Jesus Christ. My only hope is in him. And be a living sacrifice. And when you're surrendered in your heart, then you can accept his will and you can know his will and you can do his will. And his final point there that we're, we're looking at, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is where I'd like to close off today. I told you I was going to give an announcement. So this entire message has really been an introduction to an announcement that I'd like to give. Tim and Angie Bates are hosting the live, a live stream event with discussion called Q Commons, The Power of We, at their home this Thursday, October 25th. So this Thursday, October 25th, if I, if I do too good a job advertising this, you might, you know, your house won't be able to fit everybody. That's a good problem. 
That's a good problem. 6.30 to 8.30. Here's what the Q Commons, the the group putting this together says. During this exclusive two-hour evening, you will join tens of thousands of Christians to be equipped on how to engage this unique American moment. I told you at the beginning, it's not easy to know how we live in this culture as Christians. So this is to get us to think about that, to help us. Our six world-class presenters will educate, inspire, and offer people of faith creative ways to respond to the difficult challenges facing our local communities. The speakers are uh, Bob Goff, Joe Saxton, Scott Harrison, David Nasser, Gabe Lyons. I don't know all these speakers. I've heard of some of them. And I'll say this. As we listen to this, it's, it's, it's not that we're always going to agree with other Christians. It's that we need to listen, we need to renew our minds, and we need to edify each other. So I don't know everything they're even going to say. If I have major disagreement, I get to talk next Sunday morning. <laughs> but I, I have a feeling these teachers are going to help us. As we look at the scripture and think about what they're saying, they're going to help us. Certainly that time together will help us. So for more information, a link to the Q Commons website has been emailed to the church family, posted in the Calvary Baptist Family Facebook group. Please contact Tim or Angie Bates to let them know if you plan to attend. Due, this, due to the serious nature of this discussion, they ask that no children attend this event. If you attend, a few dollars contributed to help with the live streaming fee would be appreciated, and there, were, there will also be refreshments. That's a good idea to end with that. Food will be there. Um, now, I wanted to put this right at the end because we can sit here and we, you know, we can say, yeah, this is good, but this is a great way to apply what we're hearing. When Paul says be renewed, we have to have a way to be renewed in our thinking. Getting, to other, getting together with other Christians is a way we do that. Meditating on what God's saying and thinking about that in, the, in our context helps us. We have so much available. I mentioned earlier about the world is feeding us. And yes, there's movies, there's television, there's all this stuff coming at us. But there's also opportunity today like never before. I mean, this event's being live streamed through computer. We get to hear teachers from all over the world. You can go on YouTube and there's some bad stuff on YouTube, but there's some really good stuff. So watch it. The good stuff. There are sermons that are online that you can download. There are books, good books, not like the one I mentioned earlier that I criticized for a long time, but there are good Christian books. And that will help renew your mind. And by the way, again, we have so much available. Even if you don't like to read, you have a hard time reading, we have audio books today. You can listen to them. Just renew your mind. Renew it. And don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that by God's grace, we will all prove the perfect and acceptable will of God as a church. I hope that's what people will see the people of Calvary Baptist. Let's pray. I'm so grateful to you, Lord, for this church because it is a blessing to gather with your people and to know that there is a desire here. There is a desire to worship you and love you. I pray, Lord, that you will Awaken our hearts and minds to what a, what a dangerous world we live in spiritually. That there are all kinds of messages and subtle things that are seeking to conform us. And I pray, Lord, that by your grace and your wisdom, you will help us to know how to live, how to relate to the culture as Christians. Help us, Lord, even at this time, to say to you, we present ourselves to you, Lord, living sacrifices, show us what you want. Do in our lives as you wish. 
we thank you for your mercy, that we can worship you, not because of our goodness, but because of your grace, because of what Jesus has provided in his death on the cross for our sin and his resurrection overcoming the penalty of sin. We thank you for that salvation. May we live it out in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.